رحمان رحیم تھینک یو ویری مچ عادل سلطان صاحب فار انٹروڈیوسنگ می اینڈ آئی شوڈ آلسو تھینک مسز آئزا آزم ہو ہیڈ پرابلی سجیسٹڈ مائی نیم اٹ ریلی این آنر اینڈ اے پلیزر ٹو بی ایڈریسنگ یور اسٹوڈنٹس ایز یو مینشن I had started my career in 1965 as a teacher. That was a different subject. Today, it is a different subject. Uh, you have asked me to talk about uh, uh, the history of uh, the Afghan conflict starting from 1979, which I'll do, but uh, I think that would be a bit uh, academic and uh, 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 your students may be interested in my views uh, regarding the current situation. So I'll first, uh, uh, for five minutes, very briefly talk about uh, the current situation, and then I'll go to uh, the subject of history. Uh, Taliban takeover of Afghanistan has been extraordinary. Uh, This could not be anticipated the way that they were able to overwhelm the entire country. And uh, there was no bloodshed. Uh, it was uh, generally, they behaved uh, uh, in a circumspect and disciplined manner. All credit must go to the Taliban. Any outsiders, others taking credit, uh, would not be, would be out of place in my view. But this is not the end of the story. The Afghan situation is far from settled. As for the United States, yes, they suffered a setback, but uh, superpowers are very resilient. You would recall that uh, Soviet Union also suffered a setback, but today Russia, which is the successor state, It is very much there and it is managing the affairs of uh, the heart of Asia along with uh, China. United States itself had suffered uh, a setback in Vietnam, but uh, today Vietnam's largest trading partner is uh, uh, United States. Uh, so, the the uh, superpowers are like systems so they they uh, have great capacity to to survive these kinds of shocks uh, the taliban government has uh, i would say a lot of challenges uh, uh, they have to show sensitivity to the international community if uh, they need uh, international recognition uh, The, um, there has been calls for inclusive government, but uh, the government that they have formed, the cabinet they have formed is far from inclusive. It basically comprises hardline uh, members of the, the um, Taliban, the older leadership. We also do not know um, whether uh, there is total harmony within the Taliban ranks themselves, leadership ranks, I mean to say, for example, for quite some time now, I think almost one and a half uh, weeks, uh, Mullah brother, who was literally number two, is not seen. Uh, similarly, the Doha uh, participants of the Taliban, they are also not very really visible. So what is going on behind the scenes, we, we, we do not know. In any case, uh, uh, there are great challenges to the Taliban government. There is an economic collapse. There is humanitarian crisis, which is staring in their face. Um, but what is most important and most critical at this juncture is and where the international community, in particular the uh, neighbors and Pakistan inclusive, Uh, they have to address it and attend to it is that there is no civil war. Afghanistan doesn't again 
regress into a civil war. That is, uh, uh, that ought to be the priority, first and foremost, of course, of the Afghan leadership, both sides of uh, the, the uh, Taliban leadership and also the other older leadership, some of them like Mr. Karzai, Mr. Abdullah Abdullah, they are there in Kabul. It is their responsibility as well. Number two, that there is no humanitarian crisis. Here, the international community has to do a lot. Pakistan has to do a lot. Um, they, there has been drought in Afghanistan and there is uh, a threat of, uh, um, of uh, uh, hunger and uh, uh, food shortages. So here, uh, the, the role of the neighbors uh, comes into it. The third uh, thing is that there, the Afghan territory should not become again uh, a home to terrorist organizations. Uh, here, there is Pakistan's interest, TTP. There is uh, China's interest, uh, ETIM. Uh, there is Russian interest, uh, Chechens, others. Uh, there's the American interest, ISIS, etc. So. The Taliban has to make sure and the others have to also join hands with the Taliban that uh, yeah. Afghanistan doesn't become uh, 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 become a launching pad for these uh, organizations. Um, as far as Pakistan's policy is concerned, it is too early. I think uh, I have always been in favor of uh, doing things with a certain circumspection, a certain restraint. Uh, even if we have to give some advice, it is better to give it discreetly rather than make it public and then go to the Taliban. Because these Taliban, uh, like their, the other Afghan leaders, they always resent that kind of advice which is first made public and then. So, um, uh, yes, of course, the, the prime minister and the foreign minister, they have uh, the privilege to uh, talk about these things, but uh, uh, one finds that uh, the other uh, ministers are also talking about what should uh, uh, Taliban do or what should, they should not do. They should better stick to their own portfolios rather than talk about uh, foreign policy issues. Uh, but here, again, I'll repeat that uh, Pakistan has to be a bit more restrained uh, and discreet in approaching the Taliban and um, asking or, or giving them any, any suggestion or advice. We should also not push for uh, our own problems with, with Afghanistan. Uh, yes, of course, as far as terrorism is concerned, TTP, etc., um, if there are concerns, we should... Uh, and preferably along with uh, uh, Russia and China, we should uh, um, raise it with, with the Taliban and probably Taliban ought to be receptive because they are also uh, not in favor of uh, these uh, groups operating from the territory of Afghanistan already. They suffered in the past on account of Al-Qaeda. So, uh, they, but there are other issues like, for example, the Durand Line. I am one of those people, I can go into some details later, that Pakistan should not raise during line with the Afghans, not with this government, not with any other government. As far as Pakistan is concerned, this is uh, a de jure border for us. And uh, the world also recognizes it that way, and we should leave it at that. It's a very sensitive issue with the very emotive issue with the um, Afghans, and I can go into many details on that. Um, so if you are going to push them, they would basically hold back on this uh, kind, even if uh, the Taliban are very friendly, but you, we should not expect them that they would, should, they would be endorsing the Durand line. It has a history of uh, more than 100 years. Um, opportunities, yes, there are opportunities, but first and foremost, Afghanistan must be, become peaceful and it must settle down, it must stabilize. If it doesn't stabilize, if there is a, a return of a, a civil war, a, 
low key or uh, a sort of all out civil war hopefully not uh, then all this talk of opportunities will boil down to nothing um as far as opportunities are concerned you know about them very well they have been talked about in the press you know the north south corridors trade corridors uh, uh, and uh, um, pipelines gas pipelines etc all those things can be revived but in some it will take some time and uh, the first and foremost condition is that afghanistan must first settle down there is a chance there is a chance and uh, uh, the, uh, the the biggest threat uh, in this is that we and taliban must also recognize that afghanistan is a an ethnically uh, fractious country it is fragmented there is a divide you can't wish it away there are tajiks there are uzbeks there are others uh, hazaras uh, and then there are the pashtuns and taliban somehow are uh, 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 identified with the with the pashtuns even if they have uh, tajiks and hazaras in their ranks but uh, still they will have to have other people as part of uh, the system of governance so that there is greater equanimity and there is uh, a chance for for peace uh, um, then they have to be also uh, uh, sensitive to the human rights issues especially the uh, women's rights issues uh, afghanistan is no longer the same afghanistan as uh, when they had been ousted uh, 20 years ago it has it is uh, different and uh, they have to show sensitivity to the uh, 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 segments of societies who have seen a certain degree of modernity and uh, for example on the question of uh, women's education women's uh, participation in jobs uh, they will have to they will have to be accommodated uh unfortunate thing is that they are still showing signs that they will be swimming against the current of uh, uh, modern times and that will uh, surely be a recipe for uh, uh, chaos and uh, uh, disruption within the country uh, which will serve uh, neither them nor the region and certainly it would uh, uh be something uh, which pakistan uh, would not like to see so this is a kind of a general overview i wanted to give you of uh, how i look at the current situation perhaps when we have questions and answers you may have many questions and then i can address them now i come to uh, uh, what uh, i said that i would like to speak that is the history of this uh, 40 years conflict i'll start with uh, 1979 uh, the question is often asked why did the soviets in, intervene in afghanistan militarily intervene in afghanistan there are many theories in those days that the soviet union wanted to go to the uh, warm waters of the uh, arabian sea etc uh, etc et but now uh, Uh, the records of politburo meetings which led to this intervention they have become available after the collapse of the soviet union to be precise in 1997 they had become public uh, from those records it uh, uh, becomes uh, quite plain that uh, a situation has developed where the soviet union thought that they had to intervene uh that was because uh, you would recall that the sor revolution of april 1978 uh after that uh, there were three personalities which emerged one was uh, uh, two were from khalq uh, nur muhammad taraki and uh, hafizul amin khalq was the pashtun dominated wing of the pdpa uh, people's democratic uh, party Uh, of afghanistan which was uh, a marxist party 
and its uh, non pashtun wing was parcham uh, which was headed by babra karmal they elbowed him out and sent him as ambassador to uh, czechoslovakia uh, where he was now uh, between these two personalities uh, nur mohammad taraki who was the president and hafizul amin who was the prime minister hafizul amin was a stronger personality he was pushing for reforms now what the soviets thought was that because of his push for these reforms especially you know these liberal reforms uh, relating to gender issues the education and all that that he was provoking the conservative islamist uh, reaction and opposition so the uh, uh, soviets were were concerned about it and they thought that it would be better if the softer personality which was nur mohammad taraki he should be uh, he should come uh, at the top and somehow hafizullah amin should be eased out if you would recall um, uh, nur mohammad taraki had gone to uh, havana for the uh, non aligned summit where he had met uh, president zaul haq on the sidelines it was a good meeting i was there at that time uh, so, so i attended uh, was there part of the meeting uh, then he came and uh, nur mohammad turki stayed for about 15 days in on his way back in moscow uh, hafizullah amin by nature a very suspicious person he thought there was something cooking against him so when nur mohammad turki came to the uh, to afghanistan uh, to kabul he did not receive him at the airport uh, he uh, uh, at the um, assurances of uh, uh, kuzanov who was soviet ambassador at that time they the two leaders met in aman palace there was a shoot out and in that the wrong man got eliminated that is nur mohammad taraki got killed now here was a situation where hafizullah amin was at the top the soviets and uh, uh, him they had uh, lost trust in each other huzanov who was a very strong ambassador like a viceroy he was recalled by moscow within one week so moscow had to do something hafizullah amin meanwhile was quite uh, desperate he was sending messages to uh, pakistan uh, to zaul uh, haq and mr shahi was supposed to go there naturally he could not send messages to iran because iran was in turmoil it already the revolution had taken place uh, the iranian revolution and you remember was um, in february february 1979 uh, imam khomeini had returned to to iran so pakistan uh, shahi could not go but uh, then the soviets uh, Uh, had discussions those those discussions as i say their records are now available uh, the polit bureau was divided and finally it was decided by brezhnev himself who was the president that uh, okay we have to go and remove hafizullah amin and they brought uh, babra karmal and put him in his place from czechoslovakia he was brought there uh, and uh, they thought that uh, they will keep their troops for about 6 months or so and then the troops will be back and the situation in afghanistan would be uh, would settle down but as you know after the troops came the rest is history so uh, this uh, this is uh, just one important piece to begin with um, when the soviets came then uh, immediately there was uh, a Uh, emergency session of the security council uh, in which of course everybody was looking at us because we were the most effective party as to what kind of resolution was there and uh, i should say that wisely we uh, uh, prevailed upon everyone that it should not be a very harsh resolution against the, the, uh, an indictment of the soviet union but we should simply ask for the withdrawal of foreign troops even the foreign troops were not named in the in the resolution 
uh, our uh, uh, one concern was that we should garner as much support as is possible within the uh, Security Council. And then we knew that in Security Council, Soviet Union was going to veto it, therefore, when it, is, it comes to the other forums like the General Assembly, then we should have maximum possible support for the resolution and a very strong, harshly critical resolution against the Soviet Union would not have uh, attracted uh, uh, big support. So this is what happened. It was, a, it was a milder resolution, but a resolution whose text then uh, uh, became a standard uh, text uh, for other resolutions of uh, the United Nations. Uh, the Security Council meeting, which was where uh, there was veto exercised by the Soviet Union, was followed by an emergency session of the uh, General Assembly in January uh, 1980. Uh, there also similar resolution, uh, which uh, received about 120 votes or so. Uh, after that, there was a uh, OIC meeting in Islamabad, where there was a harsher resolution, but it did not matter. This resolution became the basis for uh, an initiative by the UN Secretary General, Mr. Perez de Coyar, towards the end of 1980, for some kind of negotiations to address the Afghan issue. And then later on, it uh, became the basis for the so-called Geneva negotiations, which continued from 1982 to 1988. Incidentally, I'm the, probably the only one from Pakistan side who had attended all the, all the sessions. Uh, Sahibzada Yaqub Saab used to be leading the, uh, our delegation, but in the last uh, session, the last round, he was not there. That was led by Mr. Nurani. Uh, so um, there was the first question was uh, uh, the agenda for these negotiations for the Geneva talks. In that, Pakistan earlier insisted that there ought to be some kind of a agenda talking about the possibility of a broad-based government, a government of national reconciliation, that uh, without that, in, the peace cannot, be, cannot return. But there were two difficulties. One was, of course, the Soviet Union and uh, the Kabul government would never have agreed to that. Uh, secondly, uh, UN itself could not uh, agree to that kind of an agenda because in those days, UN was not uh, in the business of uh, installing new governments. They just basically dealt with whichever government was represented in uh, the, the United Nations. And in those days, uh, the composition of the committee, uh, which credentials committee was such that uh, we could not have got uh, uh, the Kabul regime ousted. Uh, also because the Kabul regime, uh, which was headed by Babura Karmal, was sitting in Kabul. It was not sitting outside, it was sitting in Kabul. And they said that we have invited the, the Soviet troops. So finally, after two years of this to and fro, we did agree that okay and among our own internal discussions uh, we reached this conclusion that if the soviets will decide about withdrawing their troops from afghanistan then if so facto they will uh, come around to accepting some kind of a broader based government rather than this government for the stability of afghanistan uh, so we basically uh, dropped that idea and uh, the four points which were uh, there, one was uh, withdrawal of foreign troops, time frame for foreign troops, non-interference and non-intervention, guarantees, uh, and uh, then the question of refugees, return of refugees. So this was the agenda and these talks started. The uh, 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 the, the text of the, the agreement 
it was not very difficult to to uh, formulate it because there were a lot of uh, similar resolutions and other materials which were available already approved by the united nations and we could take advantage of that but the question was that of the time frame for the withdrawal of soviet troops uh, in 1993 after uh, uh, brezhnev died uh, andropov was uh, the uh, no not andropov before him there was another fellow so he became the president so there was some hope that now the soviets might give a time frame and sahib zada yakub khan he did a break journey in moscow before proceeding to um, geneva and he raised the question that everything was ready and if they give a time frame uh, then we would have an agreement and uh, the afghan issue would be addressed on that gromiko he was very curt and he said look they are not your troops they are our troops and they are there on account of an agreement with the afghan government and this is a matter between us and the afghans and this has nothing to do with the united nations or with pakistan or anybody anybody else so it all uh, came to to nothing at that time this is 1983 things started changing now this is the second phase i would say the, when gorbachev came gorbachev was a very different personality he was a consequential personality and a transformational personality so to say um, he decided as we now know in early 1986 that he has to shed this burden of afghanistan and he has to get out of that in july 1986 he invited uh, najibullah by then najibullah had become the president so he invited najibullah and he conveyed this thing to najibullah that they were going to leave afghanistan in two years time but more importantly his uh, vice foreign minister mr warrensoff who was very close to gorbachev he invited mr uh, abdul sattar who was foreign secretary and the two of them they had served in delhi as ambassadors he invited him to to moscow and there he gave very clear signals that soviet union wants to leave wanted to leave afghanistan and he said that let us uh, join hands and work for a broad based government now see we are returning to what we were we had started with in term so uh, that you ask your mujahideen leaders he, he used to call them tanzimat leaders and we will ask uh, uh, najibullah and they should have some kind of a dialogue direct or indirect for this kind of a government which can replace the, pres- uh, the the existing political disposition when the soviets leave now uh, when uh, 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 satar sahab returned with this to pakistan in pakistan there were two problems one was that at that time the uh, president ziaul haq who basically was the one who um, handled the afghan policy and uh, junejo saab who was the prime minister and who was also a strong prime minister they were literally not on speaking terms so <laughs> between the two this very important uh, matter could not be discussed so much so that the first afghan cell which was the body to discuss these kinds of me- uh, things the highest level that took place in april 1987 and in that junejo saab said that mr ziaul haq will not come i'll preside the meeting you can understand that that meeting produced nothing so uh, 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 that was it It's, the soviet sent uh, another vice pre- uh, foreign minister mr kowaliyev in january 
and uh, when Mr. Kowaliev came, then the uh, 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 then the uh, 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 ISI they gathered all the Tanzimat. By then they had become nine, seven plus two Shia Tanzimats, and in Peshawar they met and they very resoundingly rejected any talk with Najibullah or any talk with anybody. Anyway, so this uh, initiative uh, did not go anywhere. Um, ISI point of view at that time was that uh, this is uh, basically a tactical move by the Soviets to weaken the resistance, that is weaken uh, the uh, uh, Tanzimat uh, resistance. So this, so nothing happened. And then finally, in November uh, 1987, that is almost after one year, uh, Gorbachev announced one year time frame. Now, one year time frame was a very credible time frame. And time frame was the only thing which was needed in the, uh, in the uh, UN negotiated uh, uh, agreement. So that woke up uh, Mr. Ziaul Haq and he said, no, 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 we must do something to have uh, the broad based government. Then uh, another very important meeting that, uh, again, I was present in that meeting, I, I was DG for, uh, Afghanistan and Soviet affairs uh, at that time. So this was in February, 8th February, 1988, when Gorbachev sent Mr. Voronsov to Islamabad. He had a pro forma meeting with uh, Junaid Yusuf, but he had a detailed meeting with dinner with Zawal Haqsab. In that, Ziaul Haqsab said, and I am literally quoting because I have quoted this thing before, uh, Ziaul Haqsab said that, look, the Soviet troops must remain in Afghanistan and we must join hands now to work for a uh, broad-based government. Voronsov said that we waited for one year and we did not receive anything from you. Now we have given the, we want to go, but we want to go under a, under UN auspices. This is our preference. Therefore, Gorbachev has further reduced the time frame by two months. So it is now 10 months time frame. And we can't reduce it further because it is not possible logistically for us to uh, uh, withdraw uh, in less than 10 months. So Ziaullah said that no, this time frame is not a problem issue. Our issue is this thing. Let's uh, uh, work on this thing. And he said, I'll say it from rooftops, I'm quoting him, that you are there in Afghanistan at my, that is Yaul Haq's uh, invitation. So when Yaul Haq insisted, then uh, uh, Warren Sof said that, look, uh, my mandate given by my president was very clear. But now that you are insisted, I am prepared to insisting you are, pre I am prepared to go back, but on two conditions. One is that let's agree on some kind of a timeline that if we fail to make progress on a broad based government by that timeline, then you will sign Geneva and we will go. Secondly, you will undertake that uh, the, these Mujahideen, these Tanzimat leaders, they will enter into some kind of a dialogue with Najibullah. On that, uh, Ziaullah Saab waffled and he said, look, we should not be talking about timelines, we should be talking about objectives and so on and so forth. On that, uh, uh, Warren Saab said, Mr. President, whatever you have been saying was all tactical. We are leaving with or without Geneva, but if we leave without Geneva, there will be incalculable consequences for Pakistan and for you. The meeting ended at that. We had dinner and then he left. Later on, the Allah Saab asked all of us that what did he mean by incalculable consequences? Very well. But uh, except for the ISI chief and uh, one other person, uh, everybody said that we have come so far 
with the Geneva agreements, almost six years has passed, that now it is very difficult to retract. And uh, we had also uh, consulted Iran, we had consulted China, they also said that now it will, it would be very difficult, very damaging for Pakistan to, uh, to withdraw from this. Anyway, so uh, then we focused on something which was called positive symmetry. Positive symmetry was uh, a kind of understanding between uh, Soviet Union and uh, United States that they will keep on supplying arms to their respective sides. That got, uh, in a way, through an exchange of letters, it was uh, finalized by the end of uh, March, but uh, 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 then we were ready to sign the Geneva Accords. But I may tell you here one other thing that the last issue which was uh, uh, tackled was the Durand line, because in the uh, uh, I think uh, last week of last week of uh, March, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, the the Mr. Wakil, who was the foreign minister of uh, uh, Afghanistan and who was there in uh, Geneva, he raised with Cordovis that uh, the reference we just said the international border between Pakistan and Afghanistan that that was not acceptable to Afghanistan. So everything was, uh, uh, you know, everybody was very upset what to do. Uh, Shiver Nadze had to come to Kabul in the first week of uh, uh, April, April 1988, to persuade Najibullah that he should accept it, but he did not. Finally, the uh, he had to request Mr. Ziaul Haq that he should accept a more vague formulation which was bordering regions instead of international border, bordering regions. We accepted that because the uh, Soviets were very desperate that there ought to be the uh, EGs of the United Nations, the cover of United Nations under which they should uh, appear to be withdrawing from Afghanistan. Uh, so this was it, uh, how, how sensitive are Afghans on this, this issue. There was one other uh, aspect into that which we insisted that there should be uh, negotiations conducted by the United Nations uh, UN Secretary General's Special Envoy to uh, um, uh, help with uh, uh, a broad-based government, for which Mr. Cordovez, who was the Special Envoy, he stayed in Pakistan, uh, visited uh, Kabul also three, four times. So he stayed in Islamabad for two weeks. But the Tanzimat at that time, they just refused to be cooperative on this, this count. And it went nowhere. And uh, uh, Mr. Cordovez was so fed up that he said that I'll never return to this region again. Anyway, so that is it. The third thing I would like to say is uh, another very important uh, juncture. That is when the Soviets left. That was February 1989. Then there was a pressure build up that uh, Pakistan should recognize the Afghan interim government, which comprised of the uh, Mujahideen uh, uh, Tanzimat. Uh, the foreign office took the position that look, by then uh, Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto was uh, the prime minister. So the Foreign Office took the position that even during the days of President Ziaul Haq, we did not recognize the interim government on the soil of Pakistan. Because if we do that, then our fears were that there would be a government of, uh, in exile for Baluchistan and there would have been a, 
um, government in exile for Pashtunistan and there would be all kinds of things. So we said, no, these people should relocate themselves inside Afghanistan and then we will recognize them, but not while they are sitting in Islamabad, uh, not when they are uh, on the soil of uh, Pakistan. That uh, uh, argument prevailed because Benazir Bhutto, she asked uh, the DGISI at that time that uh, can these people take some ter territory inside Afghanistan? Now, because there were uh, those days when, you know, we were on a very high because uh, uh, it was seen that uh, the Mujahideen have basically pushed the Soviets out of Afghanistan. Uh, you know, they have won the war and so on and so forth. So um, for uh, uh, Hamid Gul Sahib, it was very difficult to say that, no, they don't have <laughs> the capacity to do this thing. So he said, yes, they can. Any territory inside Afghanistan. So the Jalalabad operation. But Jalalabad operation would have been successful. But for one thing. That was that there were defections from two defections, major defections from the Afghan army, one of 90 persons, the other of 60 persons. Now, instead of uh, uh, welcoming them, what Yunus Halis people, some of whom were the uh, ISIS types, Al Qaeda types, they executed them, put their bodies in crates, and put them outside Jalalabad. So the government, uh, the government troops, uh, the Afghan army troops, then they dug in their heels because they said that <laughs> if this is what is going to happen to us, so why not fight and die? And in two weeks' time, the Mujahideen forces dispersed. Because some of the key commanders were not interested in Jalalabad, they basically were eyeing for Kabul, like Gulbuddin Hikmat Layar, like Ahmad Shah Masood, they were eyeing for Kabul. Uh, I know I, when I was in uh, uh, Al Mahati, one day I received a telephone call. By then, uh, as you know, 1992, uh, Najibullah had uh, sought refuge in the UN compound and uh, his government was no more uh, and you know uh, Ahmad Shah Masood and Gulbuddin Hikmat Nihari they were fighting for, for Kabul. So one day I received a telephone call and uh, he said that I am such and such I am uh, former vice foreign minister of Afghanistan I have heard about you uh, he had read my book the first book which was published in 1991 untying the Afghan knot. So he said that, uh, I would like to see you. Can I go? I said, have, have lunch with me. So he came. Without prompting him, I asked him what happened in Jalalabad. And he said, these are his exact words. We had written off Jalalabad. We wanted to defend Kabul on Sarobi. Sarobi is a mountain pass. But then our people were killed. And then they fought and tables were turned. So you see how one fatal mistake destroyed an opportunity because I personally feel that if Jalalabad had fallen and if we had put an interim government over there, then when the Soviet Union collapsed and Najibullah had to run away, then at that time we could have put that uh, interim government in Kabul. Things may, would, may uh, have been different, but uh, that was not to be. So this was my third sort of one key element. You all know about uh, the fighting between uh, Gulbuddin Hikmat Yar and uh, uh, Ahmad Shah Masood. Uh, you cannot imagine I visited uh, uh, Kabul in the year 2000, and even the electric poles, you would find hundreds of uh, uh, bullet marks on them. 
sectors after sectors were basically destroyed and uh, the houses were houses were destroyed in, in, in Kabul. Uh, it, it, was, it was almost criminal, I should say. Anyway, now why the Taliban? This is my fourth point. Why the Taliban? Uh, the, uh, yeah, during this period, I may also say that Afghanistan was uh, insular. Everybody had abandoned Afghanistan in a way. Because if you would go to the Americans and others to say that, look, some assistance should be given, this, that, etc., they would say that, look, first these people must uh, uh, reconcile with each other while they are fighting and Kabul is being destroyed, to whom should we give any assistance? So nobody was there. And since Kabul was the capital, therefore no uh, embassy was there, no embassy was functioning. So uh, it was completely uh, isolated. Now, this was the scenario in which, uh, let me see what is the time so that, okay. Uh, huh? Me, it was such a fascinating story. We have spent I, almost one hour. I have, I have, I have, I have time. I think. So. Yeah. No, but uh, I would request you know, question and answer. We have to. If you could ask. Yeah, no, but I have. I have to cover some ground still. So, sure. the 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 Taliban. Why did Taliban? Uh, what was the rise of Taliban and how it happened? It is very important to note that Taliban rose from Kandhar area. Now, if you look uh, uh, at that, uh, those times, then almost every other major city area was controlled by a warlord, one warlord, like Dostam in mazar sharif like Ismail in Herat, similarly Badakhshan, etc. The Deen Muhammad brothers in Jalalabad, India. The uh, uh, Anhar area was the only one that where there was no strong man. There was no warlord. There were about 20 odd uh, small time commanders who used to fight with each other. Between Chaman and Kandhar, there were more than 20 posts to collect. Uh, uh, you know, tax. So this was the situation. So it was an anarchy in this particular region. Then there was an incident which took place. There was a Hirati family which was coming to Kandhar and one of the uh, uh, commanders, he uh, molested them and killed some of them. Uh, so they uh, approached uh, uh, this uh, Mullah Umar, who was uh, basically heading a madrasa in uh, uh, what was that uh, village, anyway, uh, uh, north of Kandhar. So uh, they gathered about 200 odd people, they attacked the, that commander, they executed the commander, and uh, then suddenly they realized that they, they also had power. And people started gathering around them. Now this incident uh, uh, coincided with another development which, was, which took place. That was that uh, Nasirullah Babur, who was uh, our uh, uh, interior minister, he had one obsession that somehow he should uh, be able to activate a trade route between Chaman and uh, uh, Turkmenistan. He, in fact, himself traveled along with his old wife uh, to from Chaman to Turkmenistan, and he came to Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Al Mahati. He came and then came to Pakistan via China. So that was his. So he put together a convoy of about forty NLC trucks and sent some goods to be taken to uh, Turkmenistan. On the way, these uh, trucks were looted. All the goods were taken away. And Pakistanis were trying that somehow, if these fellows don't give us the, uh, the goods, at least they should return the trucks. 
And that is how we approach this newly formed rising group, the Taliban. And we said, can you help us? They said, yes, we'll try to. And they salvaged many of those trucks. And, the, and this is how our contacts with these people. And then they were on the roll because uh, uh, of one other particular factor that uh, Yun, Malvi Yunus Khalis, who had uh, uh, a very large number of people who were, who were fighters in the jihad, and he, were, he was a more honest person in fighting the jihad uh, uh, as compared to the, some of the others. Anyway, he had become very old. He had also married a young girl and he died very soon. So um, after that, he, uh, his people, they started joining the Taliban. So Taliban gathered momentum. And you know how, and uh, if you look, people say, give credit that, you know, Pakistan has created them, no such thing. Pakistan supported them later on. Uh, and if you look at the movements, the military tactics that they deployed in Afghanistan, especially for the fall of Kabul, they are very peculiarly Central Asian and Afghan of the olden days. The only difference was that in those days they used to have uh, uh, horses and they used to have talwars and uh, this time they had Kalashnikovs and uh, pickup trucks. That was the only difference, otherwise the movement, you know, the mobility, it, was, it reminded you of, of uh, campaigns of the of the olden days. Anyway, so the Taliban came. Uh, we recognized them, etc. Uh, yes. Uh, just just one minute. Just one. yes. Uh, it doesn't hold you. Okay. So so uh, uh, I think I'll, I'll skip those, uh, those details. Uh, Taliban also, we tried with them this uh, Duran line, but Taliban said that between two Muslim countries, there ought not to be any border. Basically, they were evasive, nothing else. Taliban, our own experience was that these people were very narrow uh, uh, outlook, extremely narrow outlook. Even uh, the, on the uh, Bamiyan Buddhas, we tried to send, and we sent, for example, the General Mahmood, uh, who was a born again kind of uh, Muslim, a very, uh, uh, you know, devout, uh, but they would not listen, they would not listen. Anyway, uh, then Al Qaeda, you know the story, and then the 9-11, and after 9-11, the US intervention. Now, what was the stand? This is my fifth point. What is the stand that Pakistan took at that time, at 9-11? We said a couple of things to the Americans. And this was conveyed at the president's level, that is uh, Mr. Musharraf, telling it to Bush, uh, and also at, at other levels. Uh, one was that Taliban are not Al-Qaeda. Don't lump them together. Don't paint them as terrorists. They are part of the Afghan political landscape, especially the rural Afghanistan, the tribal Afghanistan. And if there are any uh, reconcilable Taliban leaders, bring them into the fold of Bonn. So this was the first thing that we were saying. In fact, there is a very good book by, uh, by Zahid Hussain, uh, Novin War, in which he says that even Mullah Umar was prepared to surrender provided he could be given a guarantee that he could live in dignity in Afghanistan. So that was the kind of situation. The second thing that we said was that don't let the Northern Alliance forces, which were by then led by 
Fahim, General Fahim, because Ahmad Shah Massoud was killed two days before 9-11. So don't let them come and occupy Kabul because that will rankle with the Pashtuns and your whole thing will fall in this uh, divide, Pashtun, Tajik, etc. But somehow we had lost our voice at that time. We were seen as friends of the Taliban and uh, therefore uh, our, our suggestion, whatever, was ignored. But one thing which is very important is that uh, when these people, some of them now say that Pakistan played a duplicitous, duplicitous this game, uh, we are playing both sides of the street and all that. This is patently wrong because this is what we told Bush. This is what we told others. We were saying that, look, uh, bring them into the fold of bond. Bring those who are reconcilable. Don't paint them as, uh, as uh, uh, terrorists. So where was that uh, uh, double game that we were supposed to be playing. We were not playing any double game. We were quite clear. Even as Foreign Secretary, I remember that I told Mr. Crocker and uh, then uh, Ann Patterson, his successor, uh, ambassador, when they would ask me, and I would say that, uh, look, uh, these people, they are, uh, they are part of the, uh, and now you want us to go after the Taliban we cannot go after the Taliban because if we do that, we will have a royal mess at our hands because our own Pashtun population will be roiled up if we do that. So we used to tell them, although the, the other argument which was given, by, especially by the army, was uh, uh, slightly, slightly different that uh, uh, they keep on giving. Now I'm forgetting it. If, I'm reminded of it, I'll, I'll let you know. Anyway, so this uh, this is one other, other point that, uh, that uh, I wanted to make. The third mistake that uh, the, the uh, Americans made was that they diverted into Iraq. They were always uh, somehow the other uh, obsessed with Iraq. And if you would recall, for the first six years, while in Iraq, they had more than 100,000 troops. In Afghanistan, they had anywhere between 20 to 30,000 troops. How can you control a country of the size of Afghanistan with 20 to 30,000 troops? So that was another, another mistake. So, uh, the, but the Americans in those days, they were not prepared to, to listen to these things. Now I come to my last point in this uh, sort of overview that I'm giving. From when did the Taliban got uh, uh, a, a feel that they are on the rolls and roll and the, the Americans are uh, not going to sustain their presence in Afghanistan. There are many theories about it. Some say that when Trump made the agreement 29th February uh, 2019 or uh, 2020, I think, uh, or like that. But my own uh, take is that uh, it was Marja operation, the surge which basically for the first time gave the Taliban the idea that the Americans uh, do not have the stamina to continue. Because it was a very strange decision taken by Obama. That is on one hand, you have the surge. You take your troop strength from 30,000 to about 100,000. At the same time, you say that our timeline is two years. After two years, we will withdraw. Now the Taliban had something very simple. The Americans tried to hit the heart of the Taliban uh, concentration or operations or Taliban controlled area, which was Marja. 
in Helmand, uh, which is uh, uh, west of uh, uh, Kandhar, uh, Kandhar province. So they targeted that. What the Taliban did was that they put up some resistance and then they dispersed. And after two years, when the <laughs> Americans were supposed to uh, withdraw, they came back to the same area. So basically the Americans were not uh, dealing with a kind of a conventional force where they thought that if they hit the heart of that force and destroy it, then they would be able to uh, basically turn the tables in the war that they were fighting. But it was, uh, uh, you know, a gorilla kind of a situation, very amorphous. And when they went into Marja, uh, yes, they had some resistance, but then there were no Taliban. And then after two years, they left and then the Taliban came back. So this is, this is when I think the Taliban, when they made that very famous uh, quote by some somebody that you have the watches, but we have the time. So uh, this is how. Uh, February 2020 agreement, of course, is very important. Taliban showed a lot of stamina by just sticking to their point that uh, the Americans must commit to total withdrawal by a date certain, which they were able to do. I don't think that uh, Mr. Biden had any other uh, option because what was the other option? The other option was that he could have uh, increased the size of uh, the American military presence. But when you do not have your heart into a fight, when you do not know what is the objective, when you, for 20 years, your uh, one objective of uh, rebuilding democracy and uh, a nation had failed so miserably, when there were so many other problems like corruption, uh, etc then uh, to uh, continue with the presence, to increase that presence w w appeared to be futile. And he probably thought that he must uh, cut the losses and uh, withdraw. So the Americans have, have withdrawn. But then as uh, I have said, coming back to the points that I had made right in the beginning, this is not the end of the story. Americans, if we are very happy that they have been defeated, no, sir. The superpowers do not fade away so soon. Uh, superpowers, America was also received a setback in Vietnam. And as I said, that later on, it became uh, the sole superpower also and uh, did all that uh, mucking around everywhere. Uh, so uh, the thing is that superpowers are like systems. Uh, which uh, basically, in a way, uh, uh, are movers and shakers of, uh, of world affairs. Uh, not, not countries like, uh, I would say, Pakistan or Afghanistan, to say the least, Afghanistan is uh, no capacity. So we, uh, it's an important development. And if Afghanistan settles down, as I said, I keep on emphasizing, if it settles down, then certainly there are many opportunities for the region, for Pakistan in particular. Our CPEC can get revived. Although for CPEC, Pakistan has the responsibility to make it work, and we have failed in that. So, uh, okay, I think uh, I have taken more than a more than a, an hour, so I'll stop here. I am sure you have many questions. I'll try to answer them. But if there is something that I have, I thought that I'll, I'll touch upon some of the important uh, uh, issues during this uh, period of uh, almost 40 years. Sir, thank you very much. It's a very fascinating story uh, of how Afghanistan has evolved over the last many decades. Uh, this also gives us uh, some food for thought. Whatever you were telling, the many things though, though are being repeated, as we say, history repeats itself. 
So if you put Soviet Union and Afghanistan and now United States and uh, Afghanistan, like in 1986, uh, Gorbachev was desperate to leave Afghanistan. So similarly, if you see our United States, so you at the, at the helm of affairs and policy making, uh, I think your experience, your practical experience uh, uh, at that time, I think that is of immense value for anybody who is developing policy of 